Hey, welcome to the Kingdoms Podcast. My name is Luke and I host this with my buddy, Matt Ma. And our goal is to empower you to discover how your faith impacts culture for God's kingdom. To do that, we're sitting down with different men and women from all kinds of disciplines to uncover how they, through their ambitions and vocational skill set, make a difference in the lives of those around them. And so if this is helpful to you, we'd love it if you could like it, share it, and subscribe. In the meantime, enjoy today's episode. Hey everybody, thanks for being back with us for the Kingdoms podcast. It is one of those days where I find myself just incredibly grateful uh, for the conversation we're about to have and the guest uh, that we have with us. Some of you guys have heard about uh, I Am Second, uh, which is an organization that, that captures beautiful testimonies with men and women from all walks of life and just how God has worked transformatively in them. And, and a few years ago, uh, I saw the testimony of a woman named Annie Lobert uh, with an incredible story. I won't give any of it away. An incredible story of God's transformative work in her life. And she's actually with us today, all the way from Las Vegas. So Annie, thank you so much for joining us for the Kingdoms podcast. I wish I was up where you guys were right now. <laughs> A little bit colder, <laughs> but we, it's okay. we I, I like snow. <laughs> I'm from Minnesota originally. So Oh, let's go. Well, we'd love to like, I mean, all the, the fun things about Canada, we'd love to give you the chance to experience them, but maybe, maybe one day I've never been to Vegas. Matt, have you? No, no, no. no. So, Hey, maybe, maybe sometime we'll be knocking on your door saying. You, you all need to come to the wild, wild west. Cause it still is the wild west out here. You know, still that, pretty right? wild. I believe. It. Oh yeah. Oh I yeah. So, I but I love it. the desert too. There, hmm. there was a time I hated the desert you guys and when I first moved to Las Vegas I literally was so mad I was like where's the trees and where's the water and here's the thing is like you know later in my life when God was showing me he was like I'm gonna get you to love the desert Annie mm. I was like oh yeah oh, okay and now I love it it's beautiful here <laughs> yeah right on right on well hey a second ago so Annie cool. I had mentioned like seeing your testimony on I am second some of our listeners may have heard of that organization or, or seen that um, but it's, it's beautiful. It's moving. I'm, I didn't cry when I watched it, but my eyes sweat a little bit. Uh, but in your testimony, uh, you share this moment, uh, where you're just feeling overwhelmed with pain. Uh, you're feeling completely hopeless. Uh, you'd intentionally overdosed and, and really were about to die. Uh, and so to, to bring our listeners up to speed, can, can you share with us what your journey had looked like up to that point, uh, for you to hit that, that crucial challenging place? Oh my goodness. Have you ever, ever heard about King Solomon? Right. And so mm -hmm. anyone that's listening out there, if you've never heard of him, you need to look him up because he's in our Bibles and he's also in our history books because he was this rich, rich King and it was David's son. And so he wrote Ecclesiastes and I never, ever thought I'd actually be living out Ecclesiastes. Like mm. he says in there that he has tried everything mm. and nothing satisfied. So that's what my life was like up until that overdose. Mm. And it started with, you know, abuse as a child from my, my father and he abused my brothers and my mom in front of me would hit her. And then as a teenager, I got abused by a neighbor for a couple of years, sexually abused. And then in high school, I got date raped and raped by several boys in basketball and football. And then I got into, you know, the 18 year old, 18 year old mentality. I'm going to leave my house. I'm going to make myself, you know, become a woman and I'm going to go out into the world. And by the way, during this whole time, you guys remember this part. I went to church growing up. Mm -hmm. I accepted Jesus into my heart when I was probably four or five. I feel like wow. I've always known him though. Like I've always known he was there it's yeah. the weirdest thing it's just like this knowing inside my spirit that i knew him even before i said his name hmm. uh so i had that i don't want to call it religious background i would say the faith because there hmm. was faith inside of me yeah. but i like all of us do i didn't think it, i was ready to actually live it out and even though in eight and nine years old i had like an epiphany with the lord because i when i was getting abused i was going to an actual uh private school called trinity first lutheran and it was wonderful. I had like a spiritual awakening happen there, but it didn't stick because the, like it says, Jesus talks about the parable of the sower and the seed, mm -hmm. the cares of the world, 
you know, the thorns grew up around whatever I believed in and it, 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 it choked it out completely. Mm. And I, I think about Sleeping Beauty in a way about how she was hedged in with all the thorns and the prince had to come whack those down to get to her, to mm. awaken her. But that was me. Like I literally fell asleep to the spiritual truths mm. that I had been taught and then fell asleep and awoke to this world of the flesh, right? It was basically the hedonistic world. And so I went into the bars, I had fake ID. I got a job, got three jobs actually, overburdened, overworked, could not get my life I, seemingly together the way I wanted it to go because I wanted to go to college. And I ended up meeting these two men with my girlfriend one night. We were still teenagers, by the way. Now you have to remember your mind as a teenager, it's still not fully functioning and growing. It's growing, but it's not fully formed and functioned by our creator, right? Our DNA is still, you know, it's working with our DNA. It's still building the cells. They, the scientists say that your brain gets fully developed at about age, average age is 25. Mm -hmm. So if my brain's not fully developed, man, right? If, if it's not ready to handle life and take it head on, yeah. what kind of, what kind of brain do I have? And especially a brain that's been traumatized. I've already had complex trauma from growing up mm -hmm. as an abused child. Wow. And now I'm like, literally the, the world is my candy store. Like I was so excited about life. And so when we met these guys, they had a lot of money and they seemed like they were businessmen. I had no idea they were pimps. Hmm. And, and back then we called them pimps. Now today, modern language is sex traffickers. Yeah. Sex traffickers. So I, my girl, the guys to Hawaii. And then I am ignoring the other man that was hitting on me, but she brings me to Hawaii probably about a couple weeks to a month later and shows me what she, and he had another girl from one of his best friends. It's called turning them out. And he, she taught her how to sell herself. And then mm -hmm. I learned from her and I was in Hawaii for two weeks. And by the way, when you first see Hawaii, when you're a teenager, man, I'm telling you, I was like, this is heaven on earth. Like, is this paradise? Like, is this what heaven's going to look like? I was so excited just to be there. So for my first trick, and that means selling my body, turning my first trick, I never had to have sex. All I did was take my clothes off and it was done. And I took the money and walked out the door. And I thought this is way too easy. You mean I'm getting $3 and 47 cents an hour or five bucks an hour. And again, this is the eighties. And, you know, this is like 30 years ago, guys. I mean, like literally like it's like the money back then you have to double it. So if I made a thousand or 2000 or 3000 or 5,000 a night, double that. Mm -hmm. That's what, what was averaging for being an escort. This is just the way it was with the agency fee included. I, I went back to Minnesota, quit all three of my jobs, started working at the escort services exclusively, almost got killed quit the escort service, started working at the strip club because I looked in the yellow pages. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to make good money. So I thought I would be able to work in the strip industry, the exotic dancing. And I went to uh, the Skyway Lounge one day and I was working my shift and this man walked in and he was completely handsome and good looking. And I was totally, completely taken by him. And I decided to start dating him. And he bought me a bunch of jewelry and clothing, took me out to the nightclubs, took me dancing, told me I was beautiful, told me I was intelligent. And basically, you know, Satan is really smart because, and I don't say that lightly, he's mm -hmm. sometimes considered a genius by some people mm -hmm. because he came in there and he used that man to get and pull me in mm -hmm. and to reel me in and mm -hmm. net me into human trafficking. And I brought him to Las Vegas with me because my girlfriend, she was with a circuit trafficker and he had houses and girls all over the country, you guys. Yeah. Now this is going on to this day. Modern day slavery is alive and well. It's mm. more than 27 million slaves. They, yeah. they say they don't even really know the amount. Now, you know, the latest stat I think was 53 million slaves. I think it's like a hundred or two, 300, 400, 500 million slaves actually to be honest with you across the world that are mm. actually stuck in human trafficking and slavery. Mm. But my personal opinion, I'm not trying to fluff things. I think most people that are trafficked do not even know they're being trafficked. So most people that know they're trafficked, it's probably one out of 10 that really know they're being trafficked. Yeah. So I ended up going to Vegas with him in the first night that I worked. He beat me down, took everything that I had. 
and told me that I was his hoe and that he was my pimp now and that this is what the Ray, the rules are going to go. I'm going to do what he says or else I will get beat down to a pulp. Mm -hmm. And he also had all my my identification artifacts and wow. you know my pictures of my family and my birth certificate everything he had access to it mm -hmm. and so there was no way for me to really even think about escaping and you know when you're that young you just really think and believe everything people tell you mm -hmm. and i was like you know what i'm just going to somehow stash my money that's what i was thinking i'll get away from him but i loved him you guys here's the stockholm syndrome mm -hmm. i was in love with my captor. Now I think about beauty and the beast. Okay. I saw that movie with my trafficker when it first came out, believe it or not. And I cried and he goes, why are you crying? I said, because you're the beast in my life. Mm -hmm. You're the beast. You're actually someone and see God calls every human being to royalty, to be children of God. And so I saw in my mind, a King in that man, I saw the good that God showed me, right? But the enemy used it to trap me. So I was in love with the possibility of him mm. being who I thought he should yeah. be. And that's where the Stockholm Syndrome comes in. It's also what happens when someone gets kidnapped. And that's where it originally started from, is that you fall in love with your captor. You fall in love with your abuser and you protect them at all costs. And you do whatever they say. Yeah. And you just normalize the abuse that's happening to you. You can't fathom that it's even abuse as it goes by. Like it's, as you get deeper and longer into it, you don't consider it abuse. If he slaps you, you're like, oh, that's normal. Like mm. you just don't think the guns to your head, you know, the drive-bys, whatever is going on with the abuse and the, in, in we call it the, I call it the pimp mafia, but it's the pimp cabal basically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my ex trafficker was well connected with concierge in Las Vegas that worked the, the pit boss booth, you know, that, and that's where they do all the craps and all the, um, the blackjack. If you ever go to a casino, you'll see a pit boss and he's like the head dude. I mean, he makes sure no one's stealing. He's making sure everyone's being taken care of VIP everywhere. And so he worked with pit bosses to get me clients. And so there, it's just, just a deep connection to trafficking, even in the casinos, the Las okay. Vegas casinos. And, and so I ended up leaving him eventually, but it took me about five years. Wow. He kidnapped me back, cut all my hair off, beat me down with um, five, six other pimps at a pimp slayer. And then, you know, I actually was alone for a little while, probably a couple months. And then I got with another man that was just as abusive. And the other man I was with was a show dancer at one of the famous casinos that actually is torn down now. And he was in a very famous show on the Las Vegas strip. That was the number one show at the time. And um, he started to live off the earnings of whatever I made. And, and yeah, he turned into my pimp. So I had two pimps, you guys, two pimps uh -huh. and 10 years go by of my life. And if I could say anything about what King Solomon said about that, trying everything, and not being satisfied. Now, even after I got away from both of the pimps, I was still messed up. I started doing, believe it or not, the end of my stint as a call girl started doing cocaine and painkillers because I got painkillers from my doctor. I came down with Hodgkin's lymphoma and I was battling it for about two years, going to calls with a port in my arm, my, and wigs. I mean, this was crazy. Like I was going on calls while I was getting chemotherapy, like who does that? Yeah. Wow. And well, what ended up happening is this guy that I met on a call, probably about five years prior, maybe 10 years prior. I can't remember when I met, I think I met him in 1992, but he took me out of the business and taught me the automotive car repair trade of painting cars, repairing cars, exotic paints, all that. And I got into that business for many years, probably about seven years, seven, eight years with him. But I overdosed on cocaine on August 2nd, 2003. There was a long journey in between there, but let me tell you something, no food, no sex, no amount of money. We, we had a business with a Japanese company actually called the Cosmetics, And we were working with car convenience club in Japan. 
I have never said that name, by the way. Oh my gosh, you guys, you guys are getting this for the first time. And they're still in business, by the way, in Japan. They're a huge company, but they were bigger back then. And so we basically lost everything over a bad business deal here in America. And I just was like, you know what? I, I'm a failure at both lifestyles. Like I can't be an exotic dancer and call girl. I failed at that. And I failed as a, as a corporate businesswoman. So what good is my life, you know? And that's when the, when the overdose happened on August 2nd, 2003. And I'm going to tell you what, it was the best day of my life. Ugh. One of the best days I should say, because getting married to Oz. Oh, my yeah. husband. <laughs> well, we, we want to talk about that in a second, but that is in a few minutes of sharing. So, so significant, but I so appreciate your vulnerability in that, Annie, just in pointing us back to that reality that we can pursue. Yeah, we can pursue so much, but that's dissatisfying. Um, and we're going to obviously go into that more after that. But thank you just for your vulnerability and sharing a story that I can only imagine what it would have been like to live that. Yeah. Reminds me of that song. I can only imagine. I love that song. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now for you, when, when you talk about King Solomon and just Ecclesiastes, like the, the pursuit of trying everything and, and trying to find fulfillment and uh, the satisfaction. And, you know, I think what you've just shared is, is so powerful because you say, you know, you chase that hedonistic lifestyle and, and you find out that it's, it's baseless. It, it doesn't satisfy. If anything, it destroys you. And then you sort of choose this road of, uh, living for business and you're trying to put yourself together and, and that kind of falls apart. Um, and then that, that day where you overdose, uh, you've shared before that, that the doctor tells you that, that God has saved you, that like God must love you. God must care for you. And I guess like a, a question for me, as I just think of uh, many of our listeners who probably haven't endured what you've endured um, but in some small part uh, have experienced trauma or maybe it's great trauma. Can you share how this idea that God cares for you, um, what, what we might call the gospel, how has the gospel healed you? And, and how has the gospel actually changed the way that you've seen yourself from this position of, you know, good for nothing to good for something? Wow. Well, do you know that the only reason why we chase other things and we make other things our idols in our lives, Luke and Matthew is the reason. And by the way, my gosh, I'm all into Luke and Matthew gospels, by the way, um, <laughs> is because, you know, when we have idols in our lives, we, we don't, we don't realize our worth because we're looking, we're looking to find worth in other things because we feel worth less. Right. Yeah. And so when you're not fulfilled inside and you're not at peace inside, you think you can fill it with other things. Mm -hmm. And so the gospel comes in, Jesus comes in and says, wait a second, I am the way, the mm -hmm. truth and the life. You know, if you eat of me, if you drink of me, I mean, this controversial mm -hmm. back then, the, the disciples, even some of them, you know, the people that followed him left him over it because yeah. he said to drink his blood and eat his flesh. And it's like, no, they didn't understand really what he meant was if you partake and you taste him and you see that he is good, you are not going to need to pursue all those other things, right? And so for me, the gospel became so clear and so beautiful and so true when I realized that everything that I was looking for, that huge vacuum, dark, I call it the black hole because I love the, the celestial bodies and I love all the different galaxies. And there's a beauty in the galaxies because in the middle of those spirals is this black hole and nobody knows what happens on the event horizon. But I know in my life, on my event horizon, my heart was so broken. Mm. But when, when I knew that I didn't need to look any further, that Jesus was the light that he was the love I was looking for. He was the best friend I was looking for. He was the, 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 the best food I ever tasted, the best high I could ever have. And, and everything combined, the, the, the best money and worth I could have for myself. Uh, that's when everything changed. And so the gospel to me is, is this, this puzzle piece that fit in my heart 
And that instead of that dark hole, there was this, you know, illuminated light coming out of me and coming out of my, my, uh, the darkness that I was so desperate to escape. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. we're just trying to run from the darkness. Right. You guys we're just trying to run to something. Mm -hmm. We don't really want to be in darkness. Do we No. So, so having that light was like my answer, mm -hmm. knowing for a fact, for a fact that there was life after death, that, that just blew me away. But then also knowing I was invited to life after death, mm -hmm. to live forever in eternity in paradise was like the best thing. Yeah. Like, I know that sounds so simple, you guys, but it's not simple, but it is. It's like, what is the answer to life? Why are we even here? To realize that I was placed here for such a time as this, like Esther, yeah. I'm here to set others free. I'm yeah. here to go to the king and bring my scepter and say, hey, uh, these people are going to kill us, these traffickers. I need your permission. Can yeah. we defend ourselves? Mm. Can we stop this decree? Can we put a law that stops this decree? Yeah. And then when, when I said yes to him, it's like the joy just, whoo, not that joy wasn't already there because I knew I was going to heaven. But when you get that mandate and you get that call on your heart, man, just the joy just comes flooding in. Yeah. And, wow. and, and, and man, I just, I just love, I love Jesus so much <laughs> for the freedom he's given me to finally this is the last piece, forgive myself. And mm, I don't know who's yeah. listening out there and who's watching right now, but I'm, I'm sensing that you do not forgive yourself. Mm. You, you, you forgive other people, but you're the last person in line to forgive. And God is saying, the Holy Spirit's saying, it's time. Mm. You know, we insult, we insult that sacrifice on the cross when we don't allow forgiveness for ourselves yeah. to come full full fruition around. Yeah. So I just want to say that to someone out there that's listening, yeah. that needed to hear that today. Yeah. And that that's that pursuit, the yeah. pursuit of his love for us. And, and I truly believe guys that he was pursuing me all these years and I just didn't see it. Mm -hmm. And then when you wake up to the fact that, man, God loves me, Jesus loves me. He forgives me. He doesn't, he's not mad at me anymore. That's huge. You you referenced Esther a, a moment ago and talking about being here for such a time as this to, to set prisoners free. And, and I know a, a, a beautiful part of your story in recent years is that after surviving, you know, a decade, a decade and a half in the sex industry, uh, you start Hookers for Jesus in 2005. And so I wonder, could you, could you give us a snapshot of, of the mission of what's taking place there, how you're working to bring the same kind of freedom you've experienced, that, that same kind of overwhelming love and redemption of God uh, to the lives of others. What does that look like? Oh my gosh. So, so that's a, it's a huge gift, you guys. So I, what I imagine when you were saying that just now, Luke was, I was literally like, when I got radically like wrecked by God's love, I was like, I felt like I was high 24 seven. Like I was like, woo, woo, woo. Dopamine rush times 1000. Okay. I was like on a cloud nine floating around, I guess, you know? you know, I guess whatever, but oh, if, yeah. if there could have been a picture of me, I would have had an aura like this around my head, like, Whoa, you know, <laughs> cause I was so happy all the time. And I was so ecstatic that I was still alive. First of all, yeah. cause God saved me, but I wanted to bring that love and, and that light and that, that forgiveness to the women. I, yeah. I was like, yeah. how can I have all of this in my heart and not share this with someone? Yeah. How could I not? So that's what started the outreach in 2005, I started going to the strip and then I was just basically giving the ladies books and um, in bags, like little miniature Bibles and like little like devotionals. And then I was giving them like candles and chocolates and, you know, sometimes perfume and, and uh, bath and body works and it, something that was, I would have wanted. Right. And yeah. then I would put my little card in there and say, Hey, listen, if you need help, call me. Mm -hmm. And I, it wasn't called hookers for Jesus in the beginning. And Hookers to Jesus is based on Matthew 4, 19. I will teach you how to fish for people. And so we hook, help, hope, and give women healing through mm. Hookers for Jesus. Yeah. And then Hookers for Jesus is uh, obviously Destiny House. And Destiny House was formed in 2007, mm. but officially opened in 2008. And that is our place that we have women come that are healing from trafficking. Mm. And there is 13 beds right now. Mm. And we are expanding. We have a new house called Dream House. And that is for our transitional graduates that move into that place. They'll have their job and go to college at that house itself. And there'll be more independent living. So 
yeah, we're just super uh, excited. And the nonprofit again was formed officially in 2007 because okay. I filed for an SS, like an LLC in 2006 to just sell, sell t-shirts. Mm. But then God really spoke to me and said, you need to make this a nonprofit. So I did. Yeah. And it's been going strong ever since has not shut down for COVID. Hmm. Uh, you know, I don't, I cannot tell you the miracles I've seen happen with this nonprofit ministry. It is God's ministry. It is yeah. based on faith. It's based on my own testimony and the freedom that I attained through the surrender yeah. uh, to the process of God loving me as his, as his princess. Right. Hmm. So I'm his daughter and I'm sassy with it. Like, you know, and I will cast my crown. Mm-hmm. I know my crown is sparkly up in heaven. It's a huge, one of my girlfriends said she, she, I, I was at church and she like, I see a big crown. I'm like, and she was like, there's diamonds all over it and, and all kinds of colors. And I was like, well, that looks like my hair. <laughs> I go, well, listen, I don't care how big that crown is. I said, no matter what, I will be throwing it down yeah. because that's what it says we're going to be doing when we get to heaven. Cause the King is there, right? The King. So that's great. And as you just talk about like how you found freedom through Christ and, and now you have uh, this nonprofit that's helping women find freedom. Uh, it's been said before that, that it took Israel a few months to get out of Egypt, but then really like 40 years to travel through the desert to really find true and lasting freedom. How there's sort of like this external freedom that that we experience but then there's still like internal work to be done and absolutely maybe you can speak personally to this um but as you work with uh those who you work with you know can you speak to what the process of finding true lasting freedom um maybe specifically from sexual slavery looks like right so i I think about my own journey guys because i literally you know, met Jesus as a very young girl. Mm. So to me, my Israelite experience started then. Mm-hmm. And it took me all that time to get to the mm-hmm. promised land in, in Christ, right? So as far as the ladies that we work with and the clients we work with, everyone that we work with is different. But the average stats say that women that are enslaved in prostitution, aka sex trafficking, go back five to seven times Wow. with us we've basically cut that stat in half or more. Uh, I, I have to say there are women that come back and forth into our program because they mess up, they, they get better then they mess up and come back. But it, it, it's way less than the percentage that actually get in the program and they end up inviting Jesus into their heart. We don't force them. We don't tell them you better do this. We just share our own love and our own Uh, journey with them. And they're like, I want to try that. And they volunteer that their heart to the Lord. They, we've never, ever forced or said, Hey, you, if you come with this, you have to do this. We basically are, we're, we're Christian agency, but uh, the girls have a choice and there's a lot of complex trauma, a lot of complex trauma. And if you know the difference between complex and normal PTSD, it's a little bit of a difference because complex is something you've been in a situation where you're captured and you can't escape. And it could be child abuse because you can't escape your captors if they're your parents or your aunt or uncle or you know someone that's in the family that's abusing you, right? Hmm. So it's a place where you do not feel safe and you can't escape and it's repetitively done to you over and over. A prisoner of war could actually develop complex trauma because hmm. he or she is in this place where they can't leave and they're being tortured and they're being hmm. abused. So what happens is there's a lot of mental health And a lot of heart issues that happen with that. We just have to have grace and be patient with them. And this is what the church can do. Because I know that's one of your guys' question. What can the church do with these ladies, with people that have been trafficked? Because it's little boys too and and, and men as well that get trafficked. Uh, And LGBTQ, transgender, all that. What we can do is keep our arms open. Hmm. Keep our doors open. Don't shun someone because they went back or they got back on drugs. They went back to their trafficker. You don't understand the trafficking bond. What I would do, the church should get educated on human trafficking, first Mm -hmm. and foremost. And number two, get educated on trauma-informed care in a Christian aspect. What does that look like? To me, and I'm going to say it, you guys, and people got mad at me for this on my Instagram, but I said, Jesus is the original trauma-informed care. 
<laughs> if we know Jesus, if you have love in your heart, if your first duty to anyone that walks through those church doors is to love them unconditionally, yeah. to confront them in love and to support them in love, then you got it. Hmm. You're not going to trigger someone out. Okay. Hmm. Love is your, is your measuring stick for trauma informed care. So that's what I believe the church can do. Wow. And maybe just to, to build on that really quick, and that is such, that is valuable insights in terms of keeping our arms wide open uh, to those who have experienced, as you said, all, all kinds of trauma uh, and recognizing, I think, yeah, you make a really good point. Like there is so much to be said for choosing to lead with love uh, and to say like, if you can do, if you feel like maybe you don't have the training or the expertise in different areas, at least ask the question, yeah, how can I love? How can I, how can I lead with love in this situation? Uh, speaking of that, I wonder, um, would you say there's ways in which uh, the church could even uh, change just in their attitude uh, towards those who are in the sex industry or who have escaped that? Are, are there things that you would say, you know what, if I could, you know, snap my fingers or wave a wand and, and the church would evolve in a certain way in their posture uh, towards people who have yeah, been a part of the sex industry? What, what would you say? What would be some of your go-to things that you'd say, oh, let's, let's aim for this? I, I would say support. Support your survivors or people that are getting out more than anything. There's one thing I see that the church has failed at so many times. And by the way, they're doing a lot of great things. You know, the church is, is, our, is our body of Christ. We can't sit there and criticize it and chop it down and say, we're bad, we're bad, we're bad, and then have gangrene all of a sudden. We are mm-hmm. all one piece together. Yeah, so what, if, if there's a part that's missing or that's hurting, we need to help it. Yeah. And one of the things that I know that that's helped me with my own personal healing is having leadership come around me and support me. Mm. And if they, if you see a survivor that wants to start a mission, help her, Yeah. help him, help them start their nonprofit, help them help other survivors, you know, and also don't compete with them. Don't don't try to start your own human trafficking thing just because you see them doing something and they're getting a lot of donations now. That's what I've seen happen over the years where churches have kind of missed it in some respects and other Christians have missed it because they started their own trafficking. They have not invited survivors into the conversation or into any type of care or training. And they've just learned it from someone. And it's like, mm-hmm that really hurts the people that have already been trafficked. They don't trust you when you do things like that. When Mm. you invite them and bring them in the conversation, bring Mm. them in the congregation and allow them to participate. Now, if they're not ready for leadership, help them learn, give them some leadership classes, bring them under your wing, disciple them. That's what I would say the church could do a lot better. You know, and, and if they fall and they turn a trick or if they, they get on drugs again, and like I said, they contact their trafficker or they go with their trafficker and they get trafficked one more time, don't throw them out with the baby in the bathwater. Bring them back in and help them recover and heal. Get them resources. Mm-hmm. Put your arms around them and say, hey, you're loved. We're not judging you for what happened. We know trauma is a, it's sometimes with some people, it's a lifelong journey. It's just like, you know, like you said, the Israelites, we're on a journey to the promised land. We're mm-hmm. right there yet, but we're getting close guys. Okay. Just keep your face like Flint and keep heading towards that Jordan, cross that Jordan and get there. You can make it. If you keep your eyes on the prize, your eyes on that prize is complete and total freedom to never go back. Yeah. And some, some people that are trafficked will have that will have a miraculous delivery. I fortunately did. Mm. I had a miraculous delivery that night that I overdosed. Some survivors aren't like that, mm. but just because they're not all like that doesn't mean we can't support them. Mm. Yeah. You know, you're, you're going to meet a lot of them that you're like, Oh my gosh, well, they keep going back and forth. They're this, they're that. Hey, if you just support them and love them, they're going to see your consistency because listen, there are people in the industry and they're in the traffickers in their life. They don't have consistency. Mm-hmm. They don't have stability. They're looking for that. Even if they're looking for it in their trafficker, if mm-hmm. you have it and you stay solid with your love and your help, mm-hmm. you, so you will, you will end up, you know, winning their love. Yeah. That's great. And, uh, you know, thinking about church culture is one thing, but the culture that we live in, uh, in the West and, and increasingly in our world is one of like a hyper-sexualization uh, where, you know, the idea of sexual freedom 
means sort of living as much of a sexually indulgent life as possible. And uh, for, for me and Luke, you know, we're, we're dealing with youth regularly. And um, even what's being fed to them is, is very sexually explicit. And I wonder if, if you could just comment on um, the, I guess what, what we were talking about before that, that maybe you can comment on how the culture that we currently live in um, is, is really uh, rotten from the inside. And then maybe you can speak to uh, maybe especially for young kids who maybe were, were like yourself, who are starting to think um, more about sex. What, what does sexual freedom truly look like uh, for those in Christ? So this is such a great question because, you know, we can be interested in sex or any type of heavy kissing, hugging, mm-hmm. holding hands, getting close to another person that we feel like, oh, wow, that makes that person makes me feel happy because our soul is longing. It's longing for intimacy and relationship. And see, that's a counterfeit, right? Because it's not the real relationship that God wants for us if it's not in a marriage context. And and we're basically, we're, we're getting our our worth and value in how many people we can be with or how much that person means to us and how much we mean to them. But there's no, there's no faithfulness there. There's no commitment. Now, now we're getting our souls trafficked. Mm -hmm. And I I don't say that lightly because for me, that's what made me search for men over and over in my life and boys in my life is because every single boy that I met hurt me. They Mm -hmm. broke my heart. And so the hypersexualized culture is just an invitation to, to getting your heart broken over and over and over, mm. because when's it going to stop you guys? Mm. When, when is the insane amount of hypocrisy going to stop? Like you to, to be committed to someone, you won't know who you are. And I didn't get married until I was 42. Okay. Mm. And so that commitment is so important to God because it's, it's, it shows God's faithfulness in a human being that that person can actually be committed to one other human being for the rest of their lives Mm -hmm. till death do you part. Right. It's our picture. It's, it's the gospel. Basically it's, it's we're the bride of Christ and you know, Jesus is the groom, (laughs) you know, it's like, it's the perfect union To, to jump in on that. Um, I think a lot of people will, will hear someone say what you said, and they'll say, okay, uh, I'm not going to be sleeping around with a bunch of people. I'm not just going to be using somebody for a sexual high. Um, but they are really caught up in sexual addiction, especially in the form of pornography, which increasingly is, is really accepted in our culture. Or like, you know, young people saying to someone else, like, hey, you know, will you send me nudes or, or something like that? Uh, there's a, a really a real openness uh, to that kind of interaction. And so I wonder, would you be able to speak to one, our culture's acceptance of, of pornography, but also the, the real dark side behind that, how that can actually not only harm people uh, in, in the midst of engaging in that, but also how that can contribute to, to sex trafficking itself. Right. So pornography is the precursor to any type of sexual, uh, sexualized, I would say, uh, commercial sex and also private sex. I mean, sleeping around and being addicted to sex and pornography actually is, it's very, very shallow because you're not really interacting with people on the screen. And even if it's a webcam, you're still, it's still superficial. You're not actually there. Like you're not, you guys know what webcam is, right? Yep. It's where you get on a site and then you interact with the person and yeah, it's kind of crazy. It's like, wow. It's like virtual sex, right? Mm -hmm. So the pornography is, is really, really insidious because what it does to the human brain, women's brains and men's, it's been proven that it spikes your dopamine levels. Mm -hmm. And every time that you participate and continue to do it, it actually want, it makes you just like drugs, want it more Mm -hmm. and you become addicted to it. And then you have to watch it every single day just to feel normal because now your dopamines are craving that repetitive dopamine rush And so how do you hide that type of problem? And then what is it actually doing for you anyway? I don't know if you guys have ever done pornography, but I, I was, I was, you know, part of it 
with my ex traffickers and stuff. And it never satisfied you. Like it makes you feel empty because pornography is not intimacy. Pornography is, is basically, uh, it's, you know, you're having sex with a shell. And, and by the way, the people on the films that are being filmed, it's been proven that a lot of the times they are being sex trafficked. There's a trafficker involved. They, they got them on drugs. They're, they're, you know, I've had a lot of friends in the pornography business. I've had many mm. of my friends were being trafficked during pornography scenes and actually being controlled by porn producers. And so you have to really consider what you're watching is possibly a trafficking victim, right? Mm. But also um, there's been recent stories of Pornhub and they have had many, many, many children being filmed yeah. Uh, and they're trying to shut them down right now. I have friends that are working with Exodus Cry and my friend Lilia is trying to shut Pornhub down right now hmm. because they are part of trafficking. And so you guys it, that are listening right now, listen, pornography is getting addicted to it and thinking it's not going to harm anyone. It's actually adding to the problem of trafficking because they've also done some studies on the desire. When I would walk into a room, more than 50% of the men that uh, would call the escort service for my services through my trafficker, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they would be watching porn. So, I, and I would ask them, so when did you start watching porn? Oh, when I, I started looking at magazines when I was little. So there's been studies done stating that what happens to someone's desire when they're watching porn is they always go to the next level, harder, harder porn, but then they also go to the next level of I'm going to call someone and physically purchase sex now. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's where the physical part comes in now. So it becomes you know, like, a, like a gateway drug. It's a gateway drug. Yeah. To totally, totally. And it's just, you guys, it's so empty. Like, it's just like popping painkillers, I think, you know, yeah. Yeah. in a way. Yeah. But uh, pornography is just not impressive to me. And yeah. I honestly, like these young kids, I, I, wow, our young minds are so impressionable with pornography because yeah. once a child sees porn, that image is hardwired into their brain. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. Hmm. That first image ever. You guys can both remember the first time you ever saw pornography. You probably can remember it, right? You're like, whoa. Yeah. I remember what it was and it mm -hmm. shocked me. Yeah. And our mind will always go back to that core thought. Yeah. So be careful what you put your eyes on. Yeah. Yeah. Young kids out there <laughs> and older guys and older girls. I mean, women have a problem too. Mm -hmm. Women are part of the porn problem. I think it's like 40%. Wow. Hey, well, maybe you can speak to them and, and maybe we can, uh, as we're kind of coming into our last section of questions here, maybe you can just speak to those who right now know sexual sin intimately. Uh, they, they're maybe listening to this and, and really just feeling guilt and shame, knowing that, you know, they would love to be a, a part of the solution of the problem, like you've committed yourself to, uh, but probably more realistically, uh, they're part of the problem. Uh, you know, is there hope and healing for those uh, who are overcome by sexual uh, shame and regret? Absolutely. I'm living example and many people that I work with every day are living examples. And I have to say Romans uh, eight is like one of my favorite chapters <laughs> in Romans. Not, not that Romans is not my favorite because Romans is the business you guys, y'all know, but <laughs> Romans eight, one says, therefore there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So condemnation is all about condemning and shaming. And that's what the enemy wants to come in and tell you that you're condemned, that you're worthless, that you're, you're a sinner. Now, hmm. you, you know, how shame on you, you should be ashamed of what you just did. What does shame mean? It means you should feel bad. You should hmm. feel guilty, right? You should feel remorse. Now I'm not saying you should not feel remorse, but you should not feel those bad feelings if you know who you are in Christ and you are really trying to make measures to stop yourself from doing it. And when you do what I did, especially when you're trying to get rid of these habitual sins that we have in our lives, right? So porn yeah. becomes that, right? Me being a sex worker, I don't even like to say that word, me being trafficked, I was addicted to being trafficked mm. because I thought my traffickers loved me. I was mm. addicted to selling myself and be, I'm going to be honest with you guys yeah. to other men, because guess what? They gave me attention and money mm. and it made me feel good. You know, like it made me feel good that they were 
doting on me. Yeah. That's something we have to break. Yeah. And if you mess up, it's okay. There's no condemnation. Mm -hmm. Jesus will help you. And I just want to encourage you. The best way to stop doing this is to make yourself, first of all, admit that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Second of all, repent. Third yeah. of all, get some accountability. Yeah. And focus on Jesus's love. Ask the Lord, why do I keep doing this? What is it inside of me? And a lot of the times our sexual deviancy is some form of stress that we have in our lives. Sometimes it's because we've been abused ourselves yeah. and we're trying to rectify a situation that happened so long ago. Yeah. And we're in sexuality is going to try to help us cure it somehow, mm. but it's just not. Yeah. So that's not mm. the answer. The answer is always Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. If you think you can't do this, you can, you can get stronger every day. It's like, don't feed the wolf that keeps coming. Hmm. He's going to keep coming back. If you keep feeding them, if you stop feeding him, he'll stop coming around. Right. So Jesus is this, this equalizer. He helps us get strong. He came to the earth as a man. He understands and knows. We do know that the devil brought him into the wilderness. Yeah. The Holy spirit actually drew him. And then the devil showed up after the Holy yeah. spirit drew him. Mm -hmm. and then he was tempted yeah. and it said three main temptations of Christ. Right. But we don't know what else did he deal with you guys? Yeah. Yeah. What else did he? I mean, come on, if he can do it mm -hmm. and we have him living inside of us. Yeah. And if you don't and you're listening, today's the day you need to invite him. Invite yeah. him into your heart. And I'm going to tell you something. The strength that you need will be deposited in your heart because it's God's strength, not yours. You can't do it on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Fighting this pornography, fighting sexual sin is not done by yourself. You have to let the master come in and strengthen <laughs> your spirit. Yeah. Amen. Wow. Oh, amen. Yeah. Thank you. But thank you for that yeah, invitation <laughs> and that challenge and that like, like Christ is our overcomer, yeah. which is really at the heart of what you were saying. I wonder as we uh, approach the last few questions, Andy, um, you know, today, well, even now, you know, we're doing this interview and you're mentioning, you can every so often hear Oz saying something in the background. So you're, you're married to, to Oz Fox, who's a part of the band Striper. Uh, great guy. Well, we got to meet him uh, before we started recording for, for this interview, but uh, you guys have been married since, since 2009. And so we'd just love to ask, you know, you've, you've lived the, the dark side of relationships driven by lust or abuse or just awful things, but but now are in this relationship, as we were talking about a few minutes ago, of covenantal love uh, with Oz. And I wonder, could you speak to uh, the, the contrast of that and, and just the beautiful reality of what it is to be, yeah, in, in a marriage relationship today? Yeah, so I'm a type of person, I don't know about y'all, but I love a happy ending. I'm talking about yeah. in life. Like I want my happily ever after. And God comes, Jesus came, the Holy Spirit enters us to give us the joy of the Lord, right? Yeah. So I never saw that in these relationships. I looked for it. I thought I had it temporarily. And every time I thought it was there, it was fleeting. <laughs> whether it was sexualized, whether it was just a soul relationship with someone that I wanted to get to know and I wanted to have a longer relationship with, let's say, and I always wanted to get married. There mm -hmm. was the desire inside of me, get married. Mm -hmm. I don't know if God put that in us, you guys, because at one point in my life, I was wanting to be single for a long time, mm -hmm. but then he changed my heart, you know? But my whole thing with the, mar the marriage to Oz is I didn't know it was happening. Like I had no idea. Did you hear him laugh just now? Oh yeah, that was great. <laughs> I had no idea that this was going to be my husband. And it's so funny because Kevin Max from DC Talk mm -hmm. was with my husband, one of my best friends, Heather, uh, Heather Dweck. Her name's Heather Dweck now. She was with Oz and Kevin having dinner. And she called me up and said, I have this guy and he is your husband, Annie. Like, He's going to be your husband one day. You haven't met him yet, but I just know. And I was like, girl, please. And of yeah. course he messaged me on my space because yes. my space was the thing. My space was the yes. thing back then. Like, and, and he messaged me in 2007 and then asked me to come to one of his shows at the Las Vegas Hilton. Now it's called the Westgate, but the Las Vegas Hilton, he, he was doing a show with one of his bands here in Vegas. And I was like, whatever, I'll come. But I, I, I went to the sh a show before that with one of my friends from 
church. It was a guy. So he thought I was with him. And it was another show he had in Boulder City. But we started talking and we started getting to know each other. And that night we had like breakfast after his gig. It was like two in the morning. I had to go to church the next day. I had just started Destiny House. So I was living at the Destiny House at the time. And, you know, we just clicked. Like we clicked. Like it was like he was my best friend automatically. And I can't describe, like he didn't, he didn't try to disrespect me. He didn't try to like hit on me. He wasn't trying to get me in bed. And the, our marriage night was our consummation. And was it worth it? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I honestly could walk down the aisle and know that I did not sleep with him yeah. before marriage. And wow, what a feat for an ex, whatever I was. I mean, ex prostitute, ex trafficking victim, when my entire life was based on sex for sale. Yeah. And but so you know, Jesus, Jesus, you know, is, was my husband first though, before yeah. that happened, you guys. And let me tell you, I wrestled with God. I, I wanted, you know, I was like, God, I just want to find the right guy. Like you, he's like, you're not going to find him. I'm going to send him to you. And I said, well, can you just hold me tonight? Like Jesus, please. Like, I'm so lonely. I'm so lonely. And he's like, I need to heal that in you first before you ever get married. So he did. Yeah. He healed that part of me, you know, before I married Oz several years before that. So by the time I met Oz, I was ready. Like I yeah. was ready to fully dedicate myself to someone yeah. and to allow the trust to happen between two people. Because before I didn't trust anyone anymore yeah. and I had been hurt so much, you know, our soul is not meant to be sold and used and discarded like that. Once a man loves you, he should love you forever. Once a woman mm -hmm. loves a man, she should love him forever. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Yeah. I'm a Disney girl. Like I believe in the fairy tale. 100%. Let's freaking go. I love okay. It. Kiss the frog, <laughs> kiss the beast, whatever you got to do. I mean, let's do this. Okay. I mean, cut, cut the thorns down. Come get me Prince. Come get me uh, the, the stepmother's abusing me. The stepmother, by the way, get this, you guys, the stepmother and her two sisters are trafficking me. Think about that. They were trafficking her. Remember mm, yeah. she was a housekeeper. They yeah. weren't paying her. They were trafficking her. Mm. And the prince came to get her. Boom. Oh, yeah. Deep, right? My oh. wife made me watch <laughs> Tangled like a thousand times before we got married. So it still happens. Oh my gosh. Your <laughs> wife is like, you're going to watch Tangled. You're going to watch Tangled because that lady was being trafficked in the, and she was being, she was trafficked too. Oh yeah. 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 I'm telling you. And, 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 uh, you know, gosh, just so much deep stuff. I mean, if you think about it, you know, the Lord has, has intertwined his story in all of our stories that we make up and that we, that we have in our hearts. Yeah. And it, it's always about Jesus setting us free. I mean, Jesus was trafficked himself. He got sold by Judas. Hmm. You know, Ju Judas was virtual signaling. Oh, why are you giving that? That money should have been spent on the poor. You're hmm. pouring that expensive perfume on him. Mary, what's wrong with you? Hey, listen, chick. Okay. <laughs> Let her do what she's got to do. And Judas, shut up. Jesus told him, <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm yeah. telling you, because he knew, he knew his heart. Yeah. yeah. Judas did not value Jesus's worth. Yeah. He didn't think he was valuable enough for that yeah. ointment to be poured on him. Yeah. What, Judas? You're yeah. an idiot. Yeah. Oh, but you can sell him, huh? For 30 pieces of silver. Now they say that, 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 that oil was actually worth between twenty five and thirty five thousand mm. dollars, and Judas didn't think Jesus was enough. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> he he was Jesus is and was priceless at that moment. Yeah, I don't think Jesus said Judas said any idea what was about to happen. Yeah, and that's probably why he hung himself. Yeah, because he was so devastated by what he had done, what yeah. he realized that he had done, and yeah. so and I want to say to all the Judases out there, if y'all are judging and virtue signaling all the time. You know, Jesus loves you too. I mean, he did invite him into the, into the realm of the disciples mm -hmm. and he gave him a chance, but he chose to blaspheme the Holy spirit. So mm. who knows what's going to happen? We don't know if we're going to see him in heaven or not. You guys, we just don't know. That's true. We don't know, but, uh, I, I just love this. I love, uh, you know, you pointing to 
like people stories and and even with the Disney thing like you know those are stories that are true in a way that you know even though they're not like true they're true you know like they're the most true and uh, you've you've really just shown that um, you know you saw value through Christ in your life um, in in a moment where you know you thought that you were worthless and and that's where you found Christ giving you worth yeah. uh, showing you worth and uh, I just love that um, you know, I can imagine that there are hours more that we could have a conversation. Um, but maybe you're right, Matthew. point us. <laughs> I know this is like my favorite thing. Uh, um, are, are there resources that you could point us towards that we could maybe like learn more about you, ways that we could find more of this type of thing? Oh, absolutely. You know, you guys can go right now. The, the website's Hookers for Jesus, but you can also go to pinkchair.com. Mm. And that is my show that I have on television. It's on CTN Network. And I believe it's being, it's being aired in Vegas, Houston, and Tennessee. Cool. It's also online. And we have it on our website. And that's where we interview guests. And we talk about trafficking, but we talk mm. about everything. The Me Too movement. We talk to men and what? rock stars and men Ooh. like you, you know, and... I love to interview people and hear their stories. So that's basically what we do. So you can go to hookersforjesus.net and you can learn about everything that we're doing with the Destiny House, the Dream House. And I, I like to write. In fact, I'm working on my second book right now. Yeah. And I wrote a book called Fallen Out of the Sex Industry and Into the Arms and Savior. That was my name in the, in the old lifestyle that I had. Fallen, York, that was my name. And I, it's in Spanish, you guys, look. Yep. Yes. It's in Spanish, <laughs> even though I can't speak it. My husband speaks a little bit. And uh, of course it's in audio and Oz recorded this. Mm. So we got, we got in a couple fights during this. I'm being honest. Um, he was like, you didn't pronounce that right. I go, honey, that's how we say it. I'm from Minnesota. That's how we say Minnesota. <laughs> Come on, dude, let it go. But yeah, on audio, on audibles. Yep. And if you just want to learn what trafficking is you can go to our website but also you go to the human trafficking hotline website mm -hmm. it, the polaris project has everything on there mm -hmm. and i don't know if polaris project goes in canada too but i think canada has their own mm -hmm. human trafficking websites correct yes yes definitely i don't know the name off the top of my head but um like thank you thank you for sharing your story with us which is yeah. Kind of, I, I like it blows me away. Like, but beautiful and and messy and real and raw. And just to to hear you share about God intersecting your life and and you entering into that relationship with Jesus and what change has happened in you, yeah. and how that has transformed not only your personal life but your purpose in the world and the way you've seen God work through your life and your story to bring freedom for others and and even just a few moments ago, sharing about your marriage to Oz. So many elements of this are, as you said, like that beautiful fairy tale, except one that only God could write uh, and bring beauty out of something broken and, and hope out of Absolutely. despair. Absolutely. So we are, we are super honored that you took this time to be with us. Thank you uh, for sharing.